Student engagement and buy-in has always been an ongoing challenge for the classroom teacher, and in no year was that more evident than the one we've just come through. With everybody being distanced from one another, feeling isolated, feeling alone, and really struggling to reach out and make truly meaningful connections both as students and teachers. And this is why it is so important to begin cultivating a classroom community from day one of interactivity where individual voices are heard and respected. Now, whatever attitude you may be getting from your average middle schooler or high school student, students want to be heard. Remember, we're still talking about children, and this has been a crazy year. Most of the world has been online, learning virtually, and many students have probably felt pretty insecure and alone, feeling like they don't matter, they don't make a difference, that their voices don't make a difference, and that is why it is so important to reach out as educators and say, I see you, you're important, and what you have to say makes a difference, at least to me. And so I begin every one of my classes each day with something I call community time. And it's about 10 minutes, maybe 12, of just talking, reaching out to the students, seeing how they are. Did anybody do anything exciting over the weekend? Does anybody have any exciting plans coming up? But I also use something called a question of the day. It's a way to gain insight into our students' lives and learn more about them as individuals. Now, the question of the day can be silly or serious. It could be fun, it could be frivolous, or it could be more probing, more intellectual, but the point is is it gives us a little bit of a glimpse into how our students are thinking and where they're coming from. So I use questions like, what was your favorite childhood toy? What uh, is something from elementary school that you missed? Something that you wish you still had in middle school? If you were a superhero, what would your superpower be? If you had a YouTube channel, what would it be about? If you had an extra hour every day, how would you spend it? If you had 15 minutes of fame, what would you do with it? And what is the absolute worst thing to ever put on a pizza? Or maybe something as simple as pancakes or waffles. You'd be surprised how many heated arguments have come about as a result of something seemingly so innocuous. But the point is these questions are designed to help you connect with your students, even if it's just in a silly way. There's nothing wrong with just having a little bit of fun. Remember, you have to be the most interesting app on the computer. You have to be the most interesting thing in the room or you are going to lose them. So starting off the day with a little bit of fun, hey, there's nothing wrong with that, especially if it gets their attention and holds it. And it also sets you up to be a leader, not a manager. I, I would hope that most teachers get into teaching because they truly are interested in children, in the education of our young people, rather than just just being a micromanager and getting people to do what we say because we say it. So when you take this time on a daily basis to truly reach out and connect to your students and say, I see you, you're important, and I respect you, they are gonna be much more likely to give you that respect in return. Give respect, get respect is an adage that has served me well over the years. And it starts by focusing on your students. How are your students? How are they feeling today? You wanna to know a quick trick to figure out how everyone's doing? Fist to five. Fist to five is something I use all the time. Fist being I'm terrible, five being best day ever. And if somebody shows me a three or lower, I immediately hone in on that person and I check in and I spend maybe a couple extra seconds with them and, and say, hey, are, are you really not feeling too great? Or is there something bothering you? Or are you just looking for attention? Whatever the case may be. But it's a great way to read an entire room or an entire Zoom gallery all at once, immediately. Look, no doubt about it, curriculum is important and you are not just here to have fun and play games. But until you can establish that connection with your students as really caring about them and being here for them, not making it all about you and all the very, very important things you have to say, but making it about them and what do they need as individuals to really give a darn about whatever you're teaching them. Until you can do that, you're not gonna have them and your job is gonna be 
be 10 times more difficult as a result. So take the time every day. Spend a few minutes just talking. You don't have to use the questions of the day. You don't have to use the fist of five, but just talk to them. Say, how you doing? Great to see you. Spend the time and that investment will make all the difference. I promise you. Yeah, I guarantee you, by the end of any school year, especially this crazy corona virtual classroom zoomified school year, most of our students are hearing us the same way Charlie Brown and his pals heard their teachers. So the second rule of engagement is to get your kids to listen more by talking less yourself. As any school year progresses from beginning to end, it becomes increasingly more difficult to get students engaged and certainly to get them talking, especially in middle school, especially in Zoomified middle school. And so what we do when we're met with silence is we have a tendency to talk, to talk and talk and talk and talk and talk because we need to fill those uncomfortable silences. And we feel that if we as educators are not filling those silences with our very, very important words, then we're not doing our jobs. But the problem is it has the opposite effect on our students. Students are turned off by any educator, any teacher, any professor droning on and on and on and on and on without end. But we don't like silence. It freaks us out. We don't know what to do with it. And so we fill the silence with noise, 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 as the Grinch would say. So I propose talking less and listening more filling our lectures with more breaks, more pauses, more points where a student can jump in if they want to. Because I believe as sullen as some of these teenagers are, as standoffish as they want to come across, every one of them does have a desire to communicate. Small though it may be, they want to be validated, they want to be seen, and they want to be heard. But they cannot be heard if you're the one doing all of the talking. They cannot be validated if you don't give them a chance to air their own thoughts, to test them out. They cannot be seen if you don't see them, and you cannot see them if all you can see are the words filling up the word bubble coming out of your mouth. So how do I propose doing this? Well, I propose just shutting your mouth. Fill your lectures with more questions. And when you ask a question, don't be so quick to just answer it yourself when you're met with silence. Ask the question and then just let it sit. A few seconds of silence is not gonna kill anybody. And it gives them some breathing room. And when they have breathing room, they start to relax. And when they start to relax, they're gonna be a lot more apt to want to be engaged and maybe even answer your question. And if they aren't breaking the silence because they feel more relaxed and comfortable, they're breaking it because they're uncomfortable. You're not the only one made uncomfortable by silence. Your students, some of them, are going to feel kind of awkward and uncomfortable too if you let a silence hang too long. And so somebody, hopefully, is going to jump in and break the silence just so they don't have to listen to any more silence. Now, like so many other engagement techniques, you need to start this on day one. You need to set the expectations from the start that their voices are going to be heard as well, that they are going to be active participants in the classroom. This is not going to be a situation where they just sit and listen to you talk and talk. They are expected to be contributing members of your classroom society. And, and look, I understand that for many of us, silence is 
uncomfortable and it's going to take some practice. So practice, practice as if you were an actor in a play. If you have lessons to go over, go over them at home before you're in front of the students and rehearse them, rehearse the words, rehearse the tones and the volume and the pauses, build them in to your delivery and after a while, it's going to start taking over as your natural behavior. But it may be difficult at the beginning. Give yourself a break. Take it easy on yourself. Everything difficult takes time and it takes practice. Look, in the end, I want to cultivate a classroom culture where every student has a right to use their voice, to share their perspectives, and to be acknowledged and respected for contributing members of your classroom community. And they can only do this if they're given a chance to interact, if they're given a chance to speak. And that can only happen if you shut your mouth. Luke and Leia are dead on the ground. Bum, bum, bum! Next to them is some broken glass and some water. The only other witness to their death was Chewbacca, but he did not kill them. So how did they die? This is an example of what I call one-minute mysteries. They're also called brain teasers or lateral thinking puzzles. And I love throwing them at my kids every once in a while, especially on Fridays. Because what I've found is that the best way to ensure that kids are excited about coming back to school on Monday is to leave them flying high on Friday. And I do this with a number of different game-based learning activities, some of which I wanted to share with you here today. The reason I love like one minute mysteries or brain teasers or lateral thinking puzzles so much, first of all, is because they sharpen your thinking. Just like working out in a gym, your brain is a muscle and without constant challenge, without constant sharpening, it's gonna get flabby and weak. Students are in need of these workouts, of these mental challenges, especially after the year we've just come through, which involved hour after hour after hour, you know it did, of staring into screens, either uh, YouTube videos or playing Minecraft or mashing Xbox controllers and whatnot. And look, don't get me wrong, I absolutely believe that there's cognitive value in playing video games. But after hour upon hour upon hour of doing the same thing, you really need to change it up because you're just going to go on an autopilot eventually, even if the game is challenging. And so you need to put, put a mix of different activities to challenge yourself upstairs from Sudoku puzzles to jigsaw puzzles, crosswords, and brain teasers. They're just as necessary as moving from cardio to weightlifting to aerobics, etc. Lateral thinking or problem solving from a more creative approach can literally change the way you think. And the more practice you have with these kinds of puzzles, the more it's going to affect your ability to solve problems differently, more quickly, more creatively, more outside the box in real life. The creativity that can be cultivated by solving brain teasers can be then applied to other areas of education and life, from art to music to theater and to also some of the harder sciences like math, where sometimes it takes coming at the problem from a more creative perspective to truly understand it. And finally, brain teasers improve concentration. We're living in a world now populated by a short attention span type of people. I'm not just talking about kids. I'm talking about people. People of all ages have shorter and shorter attention spans. And if we can focus on a problem for a little while, rather than looking for that instant fix, that instant immediate gratification, it's going to ultimately improve our ability to concentrate and focus on things for longer periods of time. Now you have to find the right balance because if it's too easy, then you're going to get bored quickly and walk away. And if it's too difficult, it's, if it's too challenging, you're going to get upset and frustrated and break your pencil or break your crayon or whatever the case may be and storm out of the room. So know your audience and find the right brain teasers that are appropriate for them. I actually have a whole series of these brain teasers called One Minute Mysteries on my YouTube channel, Classroom Confidential, and they're designed to be appropriate for any age level, any grade level, and really any situation. I encourage you to check them out.
I'm also a big fan of the escape room and you can find tons of lesson plans and templates out there for escape rooms tied to all kinds of subjects and multiple grade levels. I actually did an online ELA escape room with my students this year and it was one of the most successful assignments I gave them and one of the times I believe they were most engaged. I put them all into breakout rooms and I gave them a series of puzzles they would need to solve in order to escape the room. And then I was sending them a few messages in chat broadcasting to all and the last chat message I sent them said, please let me know if you need any help, otherwise I will And then I just let it hang there for a couple of minutes. And finally, I went in to each room. I turned my camera off so all, all they could hear was my voice. And I went into each room one at a time and I said, Mr. Youngren is not here anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and some of them were like, oh, Mr. Y, we know that's you. Uh, stop clowning around. But the, even those ones, they were engaged. They were paying attention. They're like, what kind of craziness is he up to now? But other kids over the course of this, as it went on, got more and more upset. Because as it went on, I was telling them, the only way I will let Mr. Youngren free is if you solve the problems. And so now these activities, these puzzles, there's more weight to them. There's something at stake. Even if they don't believe it's a real situation, there is drama introduced into it. There is conflict and there is something at stake, namely the freedom of their teacher. And so I guess that's a moment where we find out how much the kids really care about us after all. And then the next morning, I started class as this crazy sort of Hogwarts professor named Professor Krugelshinks, who I'll speak more about in the next section. And Professor Krugelshinks did not understand what was going on. Where is Mr. Youngren? Why is the room dark? I don't understand any of it. And the students had to actually assist him in putting them back in breakout rooms so they could solve the problems and free their teacher. Now, ultimately, Professor Crookleshanks was also taken captive, which just ratcheted up the stakes even higher and increased student buy-in and engagement even more. But in the end, it all turned out all right, because I came back as myself asking them, uh, how was the substitute? There was no substitute. You got taken captive by this weird, creepy guy. I have no idea what you're talking about. The substitute came uh, recommended very highly. I'm sorry that it wasn't a good experience, but I'm back now, so let's get on with our work. I'm already getting excited about the idea of an escape room next year when the kids are back in person. What I can do in the classroom with them here in person. The wheels are turning. The gears are churning. And for those of you creative types out there, you might be thinking along the same lines, already getting excited about the idea of using an escape room in your own classroom. Those of you who don't come from a more creative background, why not give it a try anyway? Because what it does is it keeps the students just a little bit unbalanced. That's what's great about game-based learning is it keeps them guessing. It it keeps them paying attention. They don't know what's coming next. Sure, it's great giving them a foundation of stability, but you also want to keep them off balance just enough to make sure that you've got their attention. And the online or in-person escape room is a great way to do that. When it comes to game-based learning, I could talk for hours on the subject, but the last thing I wanted to share with you today was the development of what I call Zoomprov games. I took traditional theater games, improv games, and I tailored them this year to the Zoom classroom. Now, any of these games can be played both in person or online, and it's a tremendous way to get your students engaged. Now, when you think improv, you may think, oh, it's just funny people telling jokes or like a comedy troupe getting together and doing zany skits, but there's a lot more to it than that. And when you strategically, it can actually cultivate a community of people looking out for each other, having each other's back and breeding a positive mindset, which I think is especially relevant in the middle school and high school classrooms when everybody seems to be excelling on being contrary with everybody else.
With improv, you are creating a safe space for students to break through their comfort zones and find out that when they do, they're still okay because we are cultivating this anti-bullying kind of environment where everybody is taking care of everybody else. Everybody is respecting each other's thoughts and listening to what each other has to say. Improv also helps develop outside the box thinking and creative problem solving, coming at situations from different perspectives than the straight and narrow approach you may have taken in the past. And when you begin to cultivate this safe space from day one, your students are gonna be more likely to take risks and let their imaginations flourish and be more creative because they know they're not gonna be met with judgment, but they're gonna be met, met with respect. And when they find out that they take those chances and on the other side, they're okay. And not only are they, they okay, but they're actually being applauded for the chances they take, then they're gonna make bigger and bigger choices the next time and the next time. And the creativity is gonna flourish and the imagination is just gonna build and build and build upon itself. Improv is also a multi-sensory experience and it improves things like effective listening, communication, public speaking skills, and working together as a team. Improv and especially pantomime can also be beneficial for students who have motor skill challenges as it allows them to communicate in a way that best suits their ability. And again, once they're met with people who are supporting them and encouraging them, it's only going to strengthen their communication skills even more. Look, I understand how important curriculum is and that it can't just be all singing songs and playing games all day, every day. But try a game. Try two games. Try three games. Try games that support your curriculum or not. Maybe the game is just fun and all it does is cultivate your classroom community and build relations between you and the students. There is nothing at all wrong with that because until you can build those relations, until you can get them to understand that you're here for them and that learning can be fun, they are going to remain at a distance from you. But if you can keep them guessing, if you can keep them wondering what's going to happen next, then you can keep them engaged. Look, I have a ton of these game-based learning activities on my YouTube channel, Classroom Confidential, and I encourage you to check them out. And please reach out to me. Let me know what your own experiences are with game-based learning. Uh, and if there's anything that I presented to you that's especially useful or that you have further questions about, I'd love to hear from you. And what about Luke and Leia dead on the ground amongst the broken glass in the water? Well, they were fish, of course. The fishbowl fell off the table, smashed, and they suffocated and died. Chewbacca the dog saw the whole thing happen. In order to achieve maximum student engagement, we must first ensure that they're actually paying attention in the first place. Challenging enough in a regular school year, but in this Zoomified virtual classroom of a year that we've just come through, heck, let's face it, you're just another app on their screen. So how do we make sure we're the most interesting app on their screen? And now that some of us are coming back to an in-person classroom, the most fascinating person in the room. How do we get our students' attention and keep it? So I was having a bit of a back and forth the other week with a rather challenging student of mine. Terrific kid, super nice, but very easily distracted and finds it very hard to focus. And he had turned in an assignment only half completed. And I sent it back to him via the old Google Classroom and said, buddy, this is only half done. And he immediately sent it right back to me with no more work being done. And I sent it back to him again saying, if you leave it like this, it's only going to be a 50%. And he wrote me back and he said, that's okay, that's all I need. And I was just kind of struck dumb for a moment by this mentality, thinking, well, that's all you need, 50%? And I wrote him back and I said, buddy, are, are you really gonna go through life only doing 50%? And he said, yeah, probably. And, and I wrote him back again and I, and I said, but you're capable of so much more than that. And he wrote me back and said, no, I'm not. And it blew me away. This kid is 10 years old and he has absolutely no belief in himself, more than 50%. Somebody taught him that. And this is why it is so imperative that when we are teaching these kids, we bring everything we can to the table. We cannot skate by on 50%. We 
we have got to bring the passion and we have got to bring the fire because we are teaching some of these kids who have no self-confidence. And if we can get them even a little bit interested by our passion and our interest and our fire, then maybe we have a chance at redirecting their life just a little bit. Now, of course, this student of mine is not the only one out there easily distracted. Squirrel! In fact, here in middle school where I teach, distraction seems to be a specialty of theirs. And again, the year that we've just come through has offered no shortage of distractions. Just being home is a distraction. You have parents doing housework, talking on the phone. You have siblings running around, arguing, playing. You have dogs. You have cats on the table, bowls of cereal. And let's not forget, bum bum bum, the itchy finger. Oh, Oh, Mr. Y will never notice if I open up another tab and I'm watching YouTube or uh, playing Among Us or Minecraft because it's going to look like I'm staring right into his classroom even though I'm watching something completely different. So how do we maintain their interest and attention? How do we keep them engaged through all this chaos? Well, we need to be bold, we need to take risks, and we need to be willing to teach beyond our comfort zone. So when students are not engaged, when students are not paying attention, you have one of two directions to go. You can snap into super serious teacher mode and say, you must listen to me because I am the teacher and you are the students and I am right and you are wrong and you must do what I say because I'm in charge, so listen up. And what's the first thing they're gonna do? They're gonna stop listening. They're gonna check out even more. So why not take the opposite approach? Bring the fire, bring the passion, be a fool, be ridiculous, crank it up. Up to a spinal tap 11 every single day because the thing is even if they think you're a complete fool they will pay more attention because they want to see what's going to happen next. They will remember you. Now look, you don't have to be Robin Williams out of Dead Poet Society. You don't even have to wear shirts like this. But whatever you do, bring your own version of the fire. You have a reason that you got into teaching in the first place. Bring that passion. Show them how interested you are in the subject and I promise you they will become more interested themselves as a result. So one of the ways that I did this began before classes even started. I have a long background in theater and magic, and I utilized these to create a sort of kooky Hogwarts type professor named Professor Crookleshinks. And I sent them a video with Professor Crookleshinks about a week before classes saying, I'm very, very sorry that Mr. Youngren cannot meet with you in person. In fact, I'm very sorry that nobody's going to be able to see anyone in person this year because of this dreadful virus that's going around, but that does not mean mean that we can't create magic right through the computer screen. Can you believe that we can do that? And then I went on to do an online magic trick because I wanted to show them that even though we are going to be separated until further notice, we are still going to be interactive. They are not going to be sedentary, passive observers on this ride called ELA. They are expected to be involved. They are expected to be engaged. And by presenting it in this kind of fun way with this Professor Crookersings, I think it kind of also gave them the mindset that the class was going to be fun because we can't forget the fun part. Some people believe that if we're having fun, then we're not learning. And I absolutely, 100%, wholeheartedly and vehemently disagree. Another thing I do is I start off each day with kind of a pseudo dance party. I'll start some music playing and I'll slide into frame with my cool guy sunglasses and then I'll change into my teacher sunglasses uh, like Mr. Rogers used to change his shoes, you remember that? And uh, sometimes I'll even solicit a song from the students the night before. And boy howdy, are they excited when I choose their song. Man, I was excited when I found out a student of mine got a record player for Christmas with ZZ Top and Metallica L. LPs. That kid is being raised right. But the thing is, I start off with the energy up. I start off with it high and I don't give them a chance to tune out because from the get-go, we are hitting the ground running. Students have been through a lot this year. Heck, 
teachers have been through a lot this year. The whole world's been through a lot this year. And we have got to remember that. Even though some of them are coming back to in-person school, they have still been through the ringer. And so we need to keep it on the upbeat. We need to keep it fun. We need to be silly. We need to be a fool. We need to push ourselves past our own comfort zones. Because what's going to happen as a result is the kids will see us engaged. The kids will see us passionate. And the kids will see us being willing to be silly. And maybe as a result, they'll start taking more chances themselves. They'll start thinking more outside the box and they'll start living more outside their own comfort zones when prior to that, they might not have. We have got to be very, very sensitive to what these kids have been through this year. And we have got to rebuild their confidence because so many of them have been so disconnected and isolated for so long that now they're getting back into an in-person classroom and they're getting faced to face, a lot of the social skills have diminished as a result. So if they see you coming out of your shell more, if they see you cranking it up to an 11, if they see you taking risks, it might just encourage them to do the same things themselves. And when they find out that nothing bad happens, maybe they'll take a bigger risk next time within reason, and maybe their confidence will grow a little bit more each and every day. They try and take a new risk on or do something they hadn't done before. So if they do start checking out, don't be afraid to personalize. Don't be afraid to call on them. I'm not saying call them out and embarrass them in front of everybody and say, hey, pay attention or you're never gonna pass my class for crying out loud. But say, hey, Susie, what do you think about what that character did? Or, hey, Bob, what about that plot twist? Wasn't that cool? And by acknowledging them and by listening to their voices and asking them to contribute, especially after the 2020-2021 school year when these kids are feeling so disconnected and so unrecognized and many of them so alone and quite often depressed, they're going to feel acknowledged. They're going to feel valued and they're going to know that e even if they don't think their thoughts are important, you do and that they are a valuable member of your classroom community. So look, I understand that not every teacher out there is going to care for this approach and that not everybody wants to be a big and loud and bigger than life wild and crazy guy like me. Not everybody wants to be Dewey Finn from School of Rock and that's perfectly fine. You have your own approach. You do you. But whatever it is you do, do it with passion. I know that there is a reason that you all got into teaching in the first place and it's more than just weekends and summers off. But even if if you're the shyer, more reticent sort, consider taking some chances. Consider making some bigger choices or at least doing something that makes you feel less comfortable because this is how we grow. And you're going to find out that when you do take these risks, when you teach beyond your own comfort zone, that on the other side, you're just fine. And you might even be stronger as a result.